So anyway, yeah, we're going to be talking about, like I said, the conquistadors, uh, who, of course, were very famous, uh, you know, during that, that period of the conquest of the Americas we're talking about, which mostly happened around the 16th century, that where it really starts uh, after Columbus came. Yeah, those two on the bottom are the most infamous, Hernan Cortez and, of course, Francisco Pizarro. They're kind of like villains, but I think a lot of people think they're kind of cool, too, because they're kind of like buccaneers, you know, or something like that. Uh, and um, I do have, of course, slides on that. Of course, I've got a new PowerPoint slide that I've put up uh, already that you can see, uh, which is right there uh, on the Conquistadors, uh, the Conquest of America uh, that I have. And um, so I kind of go to that slide for you if you want. Uh, and um, I'll kind of first get into, and I'll talk about today, uh, like the background of, you know, why all these conquistadors uh, wanted to explore uh, and all that. And, of course, in the video uh, you had seen, hey, Jason, good morning. What's going on, Jason? Uh, but this um, – we had saw that, that little short video that we had at the beginning, which I just showed you. you just came in. There was that video, which um, I don't know if I had it still on here or not, but um, it was right here. If you want to look at it later, the video, you can go back, of course, look at it at the beginning, but uh, there's the um, video from before if you want to look at it. But um, a lot of them were kind of influenced uh, by the tales of El Dorado, which I'll get into. And, uh, of course, the term conquistadors means the conquerors. That's what it means, conquerors, basically. Uh, most of them were Spanish. Um, some were Portuguese, like went into Brazil uh, and all that. Spanish actually called it the La Conquista, which means the conquest. That's what they refer to it as being called in the 16th century. You know, like I said, they all sought riches. A lot of them sought, like, gold mostly uh, because they heard tales about El Dorado, uh, and all that, which I'll get to explain what it was uh, a little later. Uh, and um, and so a lot of them, uh, especially in Spain, they started seeing all this gold coming into the country. And so everybody wanted to try and get it, uh, get some of this gold, and I guess get land, you know, free land, I guess they'd be out there. And so a lot of these uh, conquistadors saw themselves as like compadres, as I think was the term they used to describe themselves, which means either companions or comrades. They were kind of in it, in it for each other, you know, that kind of thing. They weren't more or less in for it for the crown or for the cross, that kind of thing. Uh, although, obviously, some of them were religious as well, wanted to spread Catholicism uh, throughout the Americas as well. Uh, like they were talking about in the video, uh, some of them sought after this legend or myth that they call El Dorado, which was this story about these lost cities of gold uh, that existed uh, there's one famous story, of course, the one about El Dorado. Uh, that one, of course, um, El Dorado is a, a, a Spanish term that means um, the either the golden man or the gilded man. It's kind of what the, it translates as, as meaning. Uh, and uh, it's a story where they believe there was some kind of mythical king that reigned over some kind of city of gold. Uh, if you saw a little preview video I sent out, like the road El Dorado, which was like a you know, little... Um, cartoon they made like 20 years ago or whatever, kind of making fun of that, but kind of controversial video, I guess, uh, today, you know, because of well, the conquistadors and all that. But um, people thought it was a real person. It was actually the king. That's actually where the name comes from. It was a, the king's name, El Dorado. I don't know what they called the city, but uh, some people thought that a lot of these cities had gold everywhere, like gold on the roof, and they could just pick gold out of the streets, you know, things like that. And uh, there was another story called Cibola. You may have heard of that one, too. Uh, the so-called Seven Cities of Cibola. Uh, and uh, they think that's a story I'll get to later uh, that they think may have it may have um, uh, been influenced by the old world. Uh, they think I think even the, the story of like um, of uh, Prester John or something like that may have influenced some of these stories that were kind of circulating. Uh, there's actually this lake in uh, Colombia called um Lake Guatavita. It's near Bogota. And some people think that's where also the El Dorado story came from in South America. Because uh, there was, was a story or legend that there was some kind of um, native king that would cover himself with gold dust and he would dive into the lake or something. And so some of the 
conquistadors and others thought that uh, but there was like gold and stuff at the bottom of the lake that they wanted to search for it. Uh, there was actually an explorer named uh, Francisco Oriana, who was a conquistador. He actually searched for El Dorado, 1540s in the Amazon. Some people thought it was in the Amazon uh, as well. I think Sir Walter Raleigh, you heard Sir Walter Raleigh? He was an English sea dog. He tried to find it too in the 1590s. So a lot of people have been have tried to find it uh, more or less. I'll get to also... Con Coronado, Francisco Coronado tried to search for Cibola, like in New Mexico and stuff like that. So it's probably just a made up story, but it, it obviously fueled all these conquistadors uh, to come to America. And uh, Hernan Cortes summed it up the best. Cortes said the famous quote, he said, well, we Spaniards are troubled with a disease of the heart, which gold is the remedy. Uh, so in like fact, they actually tried to explain that to the natives. Like, we have heart disease and we need gold. They kind of lied to them about why they wanted it and stuff like that. Because a lot of the natives didn't understand the value of gold, like in Europe and all that. Now, let me go ahead and first talk about one of the first real conquistadors that kind of comes into the Americas. Uh, you have Juan Ponce de Leon. He's really the first conquistador that really explores the Americas. And I don't know if you know about Ponce de Leon. Ponce de Leon was actually this explorer that came with Columbus, like Christopher Columbus, on his second voyage uh, to the Americas. And he was kind of involved in the discovery of Puerto Rico and its conquest when the Spanish took it over. Uh, and over time, um, Juan Ponce de Leon became like a governor of Puerto Rico. And uh, apparently when he was um, on Puerto Rico, he heard about a legend or something the natives talked about about a possibly um, like some place in the north that existed. He thought maybe that's where the Fountain of Youth was. And I don't know if you know about much about the Fountain of Youth story. Uh, they think the Fountain of Youth story may have been a story which was kind of influenced by the natives, uh, but also by, they think, the Prester John legend uh, as well. Because the Prester John legend, there was, a, there was a belief that there was some kind of mythical spring that if you drank from it, it would make it would keep you young. And uh, there was also some kind of river of gold that existed with Prester John and his legendary kingdom, wherever it was. They thought it was maybe in the Americas or something like that. And so, yeah, he kind of went and searched for really gold more than more than anything. Um, and um, he had two voyages uh, to Florida. I've got a map showing you like the route that uh, Ponce de Leon took probably on his first voyage, uh, which was in 1513. And uh, they think he discovered it uh, sometime in the spring of 1513, because they think it was close to Easter time, uh, which is where the term Florida comes from. The term Florida deri is derived from the uh, Spanish term, what they call Easter, which is the Feast of Flowers. Uh, which uh, I think it's Pascua de Florida or something like that in Spanish. And so the term Florida uh, stuck, of course. I think he landed up there where close to St. Augustine is, I think, which is you know, which was later founded by the Spanish in 1565. Uh, and, uh, and then you can see he kind of came down the coast. And there's theories that he also went up into the Gulf of Mexico, like where Tampa Bay is and all that. But they're kind of not sure of the route that, Boss Leon took. Some people think he went into the Panhandle, like over, over to the west uh, as well. He came back on a second expedition, but uh, what happened, he was killed by natives. He got shot by an arrow or something like that and, of course, died. So, so that's what happened with Ponce de Leon. So he's really the, you know, the first you know, conquistador that really comes into the Americas uh, and all that. Uh, then they have another uh, famous explorer and conquistador that came next, which was uh, Vasco Nunez de Balboa uh, as well. And um, he was famous for exploring Panama, what would, what would be, you know, part of now today uh, Central America uh, that you have. And um, he arrived there in 1513. And uh, when he was uh, in basically the Isthmus of Panama, which is right there, uh, he heard about some kind of sea that was to the west. And so he got together a bunch of men, they decided to cross the Isthmus of Panama, which nobody European ever done before, basically. And he got to the other side, and of course he saw what basically is the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and so, um, 
course, Balboa did not call it Pacific Ocean. If you know about it, he called it the South Sea because it looked like it was south of Panama. Uh, and so he called it that. Um, so for a while, actually, a lot of people call the Pacific Ocean sometimes the South South Sea. It's one of the nicknames they, they dub or South Seas, I guess, as well. And then later, Magellan uh, would actually call it uh, Pacific, really Mar Pacifico, but of course it becomes Pacific Ocean. Uh, you can see he also explored like the coast of Panama on that southern coast there. And he found some islands, I believe they're called the Pearl Islands, which you can see kind of in that circle right there where that red is. Uh, he found those islands and kind of explored it. And uh, he actually found gold there. It's like one of the very few, I think, conquistadors that actually found gold uh, in like the upper part of the Americas. But most of them didn't find anything in North America when they later explored. Now, there's another expedition. I don't think it's like I ever put it like in my study guide sometimes, but um, I'll kind of mention about uh, this other expedition they had that happened in the 1520s and 30s called the Pan Philip de, de, de Nar Narvaez uh, expedition that happened um, in like North America as well, which followed uh, on the heels of um, Ponce de Leon. Uh, and um, I don't know you know much about Panfilo de Narvez, but um, he was a, a, a famous conquistador uh, that had been involved with the conquest of Mexico. Uh, that's what he's kind of known for, which happened around 1520 when Cortez was conquering the Aztecs and all that. So he was first involved with that. And then he was given a commission to basically go into and try to uh, colonize Florida. This is after, um, you know, like I said, Ponce de Leon had gone in there. And um, a lot of the Spanish at first thought Florida was an island. And they find out it's part of a huge continent that's above. And so he's got like 500 men and a bunch of ships that sail up from the Caribbean. Uh, and uh, if you know what happened, the fleet, I think, reached close to where Tampa, Tampa Bay is. Uh, today. Uh, and uh, his whole fleet got wiped out. I think maybe a hurricane came up. They're not sure. Some bad storm. It wiped them out. Uh, and uh, they actually, I think their fleet got wiped out. Where with, with the, You ever heard of the Bay of Horses, just close to Tampa Bay? Well, he, all of his horses died, apparently, just kind of bad because something they would need. Uh, and um, so that left them in a bad shape. And I think some were able to somehow make it to like Texas uh, from there uh, across the sea. They never found the Mississippi River or anything like that, but supposedly only four men actually survived uh, the whole expedition. And what ended up happening was um, the four men would end up getting enslaved by Native Americans. It's kind of a weird story about that. There was one guy named Alvar Nunez, who later was called Cabeza de Vaca, which is a nickname, which means head of a cow, <laughs> believe it or not. And uh, anyway, they were actually enslaved for like, I think, of, I want to say a few years under the Native Americans there. And what happened was they eventually escaped. Like all four men, this is in Texas, uh, they escaped and they walked westward. Like Texas, I think, into, I want to say New Mexico and all that. And then from there, they were able to somehow get into um, northern Mexico, where uh, apparently some other Spanish found them. And um, so what's funny is when they found them, they thought they were natives. Uh, because they actually knew the native language. They, they barely had learned all the native languages or something like that, and, and they had realized they were actually Spanish. <laughs> it's kind of weird about that. Uh, Cabeza de Vaca is an interesting guy. Uh, he, he's kind of like an amateur anthropologist because he kind of you know lived with the Native Americans and wrote about their culture and all that. And he wrote a book about it, which is called the, the uh, La, La uh, Relation, I think is how they say it in Spanish, or uh, The Account, I think is usually the translation of it. And um, they think that book influenced other explorers later. Uh, they want to come back. Uh, and uh, there's stories where um, he talked about some of the cities or villages of the natives that were in North America. They think it helped spawn the whole Cibola myth or legend that there's these lost cities of gold uh, throughout the region. I think I, I kind of figured this out years ago. Uh, when I went to Mexico and all that, uh, been, been to Mexico a couple of times, but um, apparently I said that a lot of the uh, natives would build their houses out of volcanic rock, which is obsidian. And if you know about this, when the sun shines on obsidian, 
it looks like gold. And so they think that's possibly why they saw these you know, houses or whatever, and they thought they were gold, but they worked. So anyway, um, so that's that's the story of, of Narvez and, and Cabisa de Vaca, who survived, of course, uh, that expedition. Um, then we have another explorer, of course, came afterwards, which I think I told you that, you know, he was probably influenced by what happened with that those previous expeditions uh, before. You have DeSoto's expedition, uh, which happened close to 1540 uh, that you have. Uh, DeSoto was another famous conquistador and explorer uh, that was well known. Uh, here's some background, of course, on DeSoto. He was fam very famous. I think he was pretty wealthy, too, uh, DeSoto. Uh, he had been involved in a lot of conquests in the Americas. He he was involved in uh, Nicaragua. He helped, like he went to uh, actually went to the Yucatan first. Went into there, helped conquer Yucatan. Uh, then he helped conquer Nicaragua under Francisco Cordoba, who I think was one of the first conquistadors that went in there, and I think was a governor for a while of um, of Nicaragua. Oh, he also helped Francisco Pizarro conquer the um, Incas, uh, which is true about that. So he was. He was involved in a lot of, he might have been one of the most famous, you know, con conquerors and soldiers that was really involved in, in really the conquests outside of, you know, Cortez and Pizarro themselves and all that. And um, he was given a commission to lead another expedition to Florida, which I think the whole point of that one was to try and colonize it, you know, because which is what they had tried before uh, with that. And uh, of course they would, it would take like something like three years for them to explore the whole region. Uh, and it's important later because it would later lead to some of the Spanish coming back and trying to set up cities there uh, later. And uh, I do have a route showing you like the route he actually took. Uh, you can see he kind of came up through where Tampa Bay is again, uh, kind of where Narvez's expedition wiped out uh, right here. You can see they came up through Florida. I think they seem to think that it came up like through where Tallahassee is, the capital of Florida now, Georgia, South Carolina. They came up through the Tennessee, North Carolina area. They, they probably went through like the Smoky Mountains. The first Europeans to explore the Smoky Mountains up here, northern Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi. Uh, and they think he crossed the Mississippi River. It's kind of a debate about that, about where it was. Some people think close to Memphis, Tennessee. They think he may have crossed, or maybe two below Mississippi. They're not sure exactly. I think he explored Arkansas. I don't know about Louisiana. There's been a debate about that, about whether he may have made it to Louisiana or not. They're not sure. They think he may have gone into Texas, uh, Texas some of his men, uh, and maybe even Oklahoma. I think there's been some speculation that he may have explored uh, Oklahoma uh, as well. Uh, and... Um, yeah, the thing he's known for, he's the one who discovers the Mississippi River. He's like the first to cross it and, and write about it uh, and all of that. And so that's that's really what he becomes famous for, uh, which will kind of influence other explorers you know, later to come back uh, and all that. But yeah, he died on the expedition. I think they, they're not sure what killed him, some kind of fever or illness, maybe malaria. Uh, but apparently they buried him in the river because uh, they didn't want anybody to know you know, that uh, I think they told all the natives that they were gods or something like that. So they wouldn't attack them and all that. Uh, but um, after he died, like his men, then uh, they say went back and they, they went to Mexico after that is what they did pretty much to get back, get back home and all that. Uh, De Soto is important, by the way, because within so many years after that, the Spanish would come back and start building cities in North America. And of course, one of the most famous was St. Augustine, you know, that's built in Northeastern Florida, uh, founded in 1565. Uh, so they'll, they'll, they'll build that. And that's the oldest actual city uh, in North America still today. Uh, uh, Florida, not kind of Caribbean, no, it is not North America, uh, really. Oh, Latasha. Hey, what's going on? Good morning. I missed that one. But anyway, um, so yeah, we're talking about um, uh, Hernando de Soto. Now, another explorer, which uh, in Caquisador, that's very infamous, uh, is Coronado, Francisco Coronado, uh, who had come after, of course, de Soto's expedition. He's kind of a ruthless um, conquistador that you always hear stories about uh, and all that. 
Uh, yeah, he was a conquistador who um, was actually a governor of the northern part of Mexico, uh, some kind of state that they found there called New Galatia. And uh, apparently what happened was Coronado heard about this rumor of Cibola, the seven seven cities of gold or whatever, which is probably from that book by uh, Capisa de Vaca that I told you about. That's probably where they got the idea from. And so he went and searched for it. And so you, you can see he went with like several hundred men, Spanish, I think Spanish troops and a bunch of Indians uh, that he went with uh, to explore it. And uh, they think he uh, went up into northern Mexico uh, where uh, the Gulf of Car Cal California is about. And he crossed over into like where uh, Arizona, New Mexico is, uh, which he became famous for really one of the first uh, Europeans to explore that area. That's what would be now, I guess, called today southwestern part of the United States, New Mexico uh, and Arizona. Yeah, he was inspired by the Cibola uh, story. And uh, apparently he found this Indian uh, that was like a, became like his guide. To, to try to you know tell him where all the Indians were, where the where the gold was, I think his name was the Turk is what the Spanish called him because they he knew Spanish or something like that, and um, the Spanish all believed that the uh, Pueblo Indians that lived in like New Mexico, like the Zuni Indians now today, they thought they were the Indians that were part of the the seven cities of gold, you know, and all that Cibola or whatever. And uh, Coronado was kind of cruel uh, to a lot of the natives. Uh, like uh, he forced them to convert to Catholicism. Like if they didn't convert, they they would just kill them on the spot. You know, pretty much. Yeah, I think they may have burned some of their villages. I guess when they wouldn't tell them where the gold was. Uh, and uh, they, they kept going. They actually kept going. Uh, and uh, I think I've got a map showing you um, the route that Coronado and his men took. But they believe that he may have gone into like the Midwest where the Great Plains is, like uh, all the way to Kansas where the Kansas River is, uh, they believe. Uh, and uh, he, he supposedly claims that in the spring of 1541, he found this uh, Indian village uh, near the Kansas River that he called Quivera, which is sometimes the other name they call the, some of the lost cities of gold, uh, Cibola y Quivera. I think it's what sometimes the Spanish called it. And uh, so he, he kind of lived there for a little bit, and then he went back, of course, towards uh, Mexico and all that. Uh, but, yeah, he didn't find any gold on, on the expedition. And he, he was greatly disappointed about that on the way back. Um, but uh, there's this another side story, which is famous, about Coronado. Not him, but some of his men discovered the Colorado River, Colorado River Basin. You know that up in, like, where Arizona is and all that. And they actually found the Grand Canyon. They were like the first Europeans to see it, uh, believe it or not. And um, But um, I think there was one guy, a Spanish conquistador, wrote about it. But apparently he says that all, most of the conquistadors were, were actually unimpressed with it. They thought it was one big hole in the ground uh, because um, they couldn't find any gold. So they, they, couldn't, they, they kind of miffed about that. No gold, let's get out of here, who cares, that kind of thing. But, of course, later people come back later and think it's you know beautiful. Have you ever seen the Grand Canyon and all that? So, so that was Coronado's expedition. Uh, he actually went bankrupt uh, from this expedition, like lost a lot of money from it uh, and died kind of a poor man. So not all these conquistadors, you know, made money. Now, of course, I will get to the ones that did make money, which, of course, are well known. And, of course, it's these two, uh, which are here, Hernan Cortez, you know, uh, and Pizarro, those, those two, those two conquistadors, you know, are considered the most ruthless, uh, became the most wealthy uh, out of the different conquistadors. So I'm going to talk a little bit about them today. Uh, I think that's about all I'll probably get to today, but I'll talk about Cortez and Pizarro uh, and all that. So let's go ahead and first talk about Cortez first, uh, a little bit uh, background, of course, uh, about about him. Cortez, believe it or not, was not a soldier. It's one of the weird things about him. Like most of the conquistadors that went to the Americas were soldiers. They really were. They were actually trained in the arts of war. Uh, in fact, Spain had gone through this period called the, um, I think it was called the uh, Reconquista. I believe is what they call it, the reconquest of like the southern part of Spain where they defeated the um, Moors, like the Muslim Moors. 
you know, they took it over, forced them to convert and all that, the Catholicism. And uh, but uh, Cortez was actually a schoolboy. He was um, a law student. I think he was a notary public as well uh, by trade. And uh, he heard about what was going on in the New World. And so he sought his fortune. He was from Medellin, Spain, uh, which is kind of a rough town, city if you've ever been to it uh, in Spain. Uh, a lot of thugs came from there, I guess, a lot of these conquistadors. Uh, and um, they sought their fortunes, you know. Um, and so in the early 1500s, he, he eventually came to the Americas, like the Caribbean at first. And he heard about Mexico uh, and all that. So uh, he got together this expedition later. And, of course, what Cortez is known for, as you can see, he's famous for conquering the Aztec Empire uh, and, of course, Mexico uh, overall. Now, his expedition uh, in, in the course of the conquest of Mexico would take, like, at least around, like, two, three years uh, for actually do it. Uh, and uh, his expedition uh, only had a couple hundred men uh, that were initially involved in it. Uh, they sailed with several ships uh, from like the Caribbean to the Yucatan uh, first, like in 1519. Like, I think it was in the spring of 1519. And but they had like I'll get to it later. They, uh, the uh, Spanish uh, had a big um, advantage uh, as they went into the Americas, which I want to kind of share a little video with you. But you know, it, we talked about disease, right? being something that was kind of an advantage uh, for uh, like when the Europeans came and took over the Americas. But you have to understand that the, uh, that the uh, Europeans had, you know, better weaponry, you know, and better technology, which enabled them to conquer uh, the new world. Now, I have a short video I'll show you. Uh, I think it was visually on the history channel, but it kind of goes into like some of the weaponry uh, that the conquistadors used. So it's a brief, it's like five, six minutes, but it kind of goes into like all the different weapons that they use, which is kind of surprising, some of them. Welcome to Conquerors. I'm Captain Dale Dye. Nearly 500 years ago, Spanish conquistadors began their conquest of the Americas. The most successful of them all was Hernán Cortés. When Cortés and his men first landed in Mexico in 1519, they carried weapons like this, finely tempered Spanish swords. The people he faced, the Aztecs under Montezuma, were still using relatively primitive weapons like this obsidian blade. Now, obsidian is sharp, but it's very fragile. No match for Spanish steel. Just as importantly, the Aztecs often didn't use their obsidian weapons to kill their enemies. Sometimes they used them to wound or capture an enemy so he could be used as a slave or a human sacrifice. Both sides, Spaniards and Aztecs, thought their weapons would bring them victory. In February of 1519, Spanish conquistador Hernán Cortés landed with his fleet at Cozumel, Mexico, on the Yucatán coast. Though he wasn't the first conquistador to land on these shores, he was the best armed. Cortes brought the most cutting edge weaponry available, including cannons. Cannons are light. They're probably not the Lombards they brought. These are falconets, light breech loading artillery. Cannons like these were small but effective. Not only did they tear major holes in native formations, but they scared the hell out of them. They didn't have gunpowder in the New World before Cortez got there. So on the battlefield, a weapon like this was a distinct physical and psychological advantage. The conquistadors also carried a matchlock musket that shot a solid lead ball. Not very accurate, but deadly at close range. Another specialty weapon was the crossbow. Now a crossbow like this could fire a bolt out to an effective range of 100 yards or more. Cortez had special units of conquistadors who were assigned just to load these weapons. And he had other units assigned just to fire them. But for sheer innovation, shock value, and usefulness, Nothing beats these next two secret weapons. And this was Cortez's first secret weapon, a bull mastiff. 
trained to kill and often outfitted with their own suits of armor, war dogs were shocking to the natives. They'd never seen dogs trained to attack men. Cortez's other secret weapon was the horse. He was the first Spaniard to bring them to the New World. Now, he only brought a dozen or so, but on the battlefield, they made all the difference. The natives thought his horses were dragons. On the battlefield, that was a distinct psychological advantage. The Mayan warriors were no match for the modern conquistadors on horseback. They thought the horse and rider were one divine being. The native peoples were terrified of the horses. They had never seen anything like it before. Cortez followed with the firing of his cannons. The Mayans were frightened, but continued fighting. Then, Cortez ordered a rear flank attack, and the bloody battle came to an end. On paper, the Spaniards should not have been a threat to Montezuma. Cortez had an army of barely 500 men compared to hundreds of thousands of Aztec warriors. And yet, Montezuma feared Cortez. Cortez had arrived during a season when the Aztec calendar didn't allow Montezuma to wage or even prepare for war. Because the Aztecs really went to war from early December until April during the dry season uh, after the harvest. So he hadn't raised the armies, retrained the armies, stored all the food. He wasn't prepared for war. In addition, Cortez had arrived during a sacred year on the Aztec calendar, the year when the Aztec god called Quetzalcoatl was supposed to return. An ancient prophecy foretold that the bearded and feathered god Quetzalcoatl would return on a ship from the east to take back and rule the land of the Aztecs. Cortez came from the east. He was bearded, and he arrived in early 1519, roughly equivalent to the year and date in the Aztec prophecy. Montezuma thought Cortez was a god. Montezuma thought he was immortal, that he couldn't be killed. And that was a weapon even Cortez couldn't have dreamed of. The Spaniards, given their weapons and tactics, couldn't always take the offensive. They were too few, but they were very good at taking the defensive. They could withdraw into themselves and hold a very small perimeter. And the advantage the Spaniards had is their weapons could penetrate the opposing line every time. The artillery also caused native warriors to panic. Their confusion made them easy targets for mounted conquistadors. So it's almost like aliens come from out of space, you know, really just so much, so much more advanced, you know, than the um, what they had, the natives. So, so anyway, kind of talking about, you know, Hernan Cortez, of course, conquistadors coming into, of course, Mexico right there. Now, uh, of course, I want to continue and talk about uh, when Cortez, of course, went into uh, Mexico, he uh, acquired some slave girls, which there was one girl that's kind of important they always talk about, uh, which is uh, Donna Marina or Melanitsin, I think they call her as well. Uh, well actually, they call her La Malinche as the common name they now call her, of course, uh, in Mexico now. And she was a Maya slave girl uh, that uh, Cortez kind of became, she kind of became like his mis the mistress of uh, Cortez. And uh, importantly, she was like a translator. Uh, the fact that she was able to, she knew the Aztec language, Nahuatl, uh, which she, you know, enabled, you know, uh, Cortez to understand the Aztecs. Uh, so it kind of, that gave him a kind of a secret weapon there too, uh, as well. So there's been a lot of stories, you know, told about, about her. I think I've got a picture I thought of, um, where is she at? Somewhere there she is right there at the top left, of course. Uh, La Malinche. I think La Malinche means um, the captain's woman or something like that. Uh, but um, she's kind of important uh, in, in, you know, um, Cortez conquering Mexico. And I think a lot of people in Mexico kind of see her as this, this evil woman, you know, that, that enabled that. Uh, and uh, actually they had a son together. Uh, I think his name was uh, Martin. Yeah, Martin uh, Cortez. Uh, and Martin is considered the first, um, what they call Mestizo. I think they called him El Mestizo, uh, was what he was nicknamed. Uh, I do got a picture here showing you the route uh, that Cortez took, uh, of course, uh, into Mexico. Like the Aztecs were pretty impressed 
uh, with, like I said, all the weaponry uh, that the uh, Spanish had, the horses. Uh, they had never seen men with beards. That was something that was kind of a shock to them uh, also as well, because like most Native Americans don't have you know, facial hair much uh, as a whole. So it's almost like these, they're like aliens coming from like these wooden ships, you know, out of the water, which is kind of, kind of a crazy thing. Uh, and um, so, yeah, the, uh, the, you can see the route he took. He, uh, Veracruz, by the way, which is on the Gulf of Mexico, was a city that Cortez founded. Uh, and then from there, he pushed westward uh, into what is the Valley of Mexico or Central Mexico uh, today. And that was, of course, where the uh, Aztec Empire is. The Aztec Empire was based around where Mexico City is today. And uh, the Aztecs had a capital that was called Tenochtitlan, uh, which you see there. It was actually in the middle of a lake, I think Lake Texacoco or something like that, they called it. And uh, what was the Aztecs? The Aztecs was like a Native American uh, confederation or alliance of various Indian tribes. Uh, that lived in the Valley of Mexico or Central Mexico uh, right there. And they were ruled by emperors who were uh, kind of seen like, like gods. They were kind of worshipped like gods or kind of like a pharaoh or something like that. And they were a very warlike people, uh, you know, because they, they basically uh, treat a lot of the other uh, Indian uh, tribes around them kind of poorly. And so you'll see one there, like I think the Slash call of you see them, uh, on that map there, they basically um, didn't like the Aztecs, and they actually helped Cortes conquer Mexico, uh, believe it or not. Uh, they're also called the Nahuatl, and then some people call the Aztecs the Mexica, is another nickname uh, that they call them as well. Now, of course, I was talking about, you know, you got the uh, emperor of, of, Mex of, of uh, Mexico or the Aztecs, uh, which, of course, is Montezuma, which it's spelled different ways. It's also pronounced Moctezuma with a C instead of an N. Yeah, Moctezuma or Montezuma II, I believe, is the official historical uh, name he goes by because I think it was a second ruler before that that was there as well. And uh, like they said, uh, you know, um, Montezuma thought that Cortez was a god. Uh, so he kind of took advantage of that. And the guy they talked about was the god Quetzal Quetzalcoatl, which is the so-called Aztec feather serpent god. It was believed to be some kind of god that was banished to the east. It was going to come back. And supposedly this year, 1519, was, was supposed to be the year that that god was supposed to return, like some kind of messiah or something like that. Sounds like that. Uh, and so it's kind of like total coincidence that he kind of shows up, you know, uh, Cortez. Uh, the two would eventually meet. In fact, there's a famous story where the two met uh, in what is now Mexico City uh, in Tenochtitlan. The date is November 8th, 1519. Uh, there's actually a spot where actually they met, which is uh, now a hospital in Mexico City called the Hospital de Jesus. That's actually where they met. There's like a courtyard where supposedly they met. And I think there's a painting on the wall kind of similar to that. Uh, but the two would the two would meet each other uh, in the capital. And Montezuma, thinking that Cortez is a god, you know, you know, doesn't do anything to him, doesn't, doesn't kill him or anything like that. And he actually puts him up in his palace, <laughs> believe it or not, like trust him that much uh, to do that. And then, of course, Cortez takes advantage of that, the fact that, he, that he's seen as a god. And he captures Montezuma and basically threatens him to basically kill him if he doesn't basically become his puppet. Uh, and so what uh, Cortes does, he used Montezuma to basically try and take control of the Aztec empire. And uh, eventually within like a couple months after that, the Aztecs realized that Montezuma is now a puppet of Cortes. And uh, what happens uh, in the um, summer of 1520, the Aztecs rebel uh, against Montezuma and Cortes, they actually kill Montezuma. They kill him. And then they try to take out Cortes, but Cortes eventually flees uh, from Tenochtitlan, from the capital. He tries to get out on the night of June 30th, 1520, uh, which uh, the uh, Spanish call it later Noche Triste, which means the sad night or the night of tears. 
I think it's also called as well. And some of his men didn't make it out. You know about some got captured uh, or killed. And those men that were left behind or captured, if you know about it, were sacrificed uh, to the Aztec war god, uh, Huitzilopochtli, uh, they call it. And I don't know if you know about the Aztecs, but the Aztecs, when they would sacrifice somebody, they would cut your heart out. I think they decapitate you first, and then they would rip your heart out, uh, and they would put it in the uh, temple of the war god, like all the hearts that they ripped out and stuff like that. Pretty horrific, which I think the Spanish thought that was awful, you know, with the, some of these human sacrifices you know, that they were doing uh, and all that. And um, so Cortez is forced to flee uh, at that point. Uh, and what happens is in 1521, he comes back. Uh, and uh, he actually goes back to Slash Kala, and he gets some of the Slash Kala's you know, military aid from them, and they, they actually help him lay siege uh, to Tenochtitlan, which, which I think lasts like something like three months, uh, that the Spanish and his allies um, lay siege to him. And eventually they take the city, and that's pretty much the end of the Aztecs. So... Aztecs weren't really used to that kind of warfare, uh, more or less. And uh, from there, what happens is Cortez, then um, he actually founds Mexico City. So in a sense, you know, Cortez is kind of considered like the father of what we be now later, modern Mexico uh, today. Uh, and like the ruins of Tenochtitlan, which live was burned, uh, except for, I think some of the temples are still there uh, in part of this old part of the city. But uh, he would build basically what we call New Spain or what we call Mexico. That becomes the actual colony uh, or vice royalty of the Spanish Empire uh, afterwards with Mexico City as, as, as capital as a whole. So, so yeah, so, yeah, he was, he was pretty ruthless. Um, Cortez got very wealthy off of it. Uh, he felt bad about it later, if you know about it. And so... Uh, there's a story where he supposedly built a hospital uh, on the site of where he and uh, Montezuma met. Uh, and Cortez is actually buried in Mexico City today, like his remains. All right. Then we've got, of course, another um, conquistador I want to talk about. Like one, I guess I've tapped one more we can get into, which is very famous, uh, which, of course, is uh, Francisco Pizarro. I think he he might be even more ruthless than uh, what is Cortez here. Um, yeah, it's a lot of hearts. It is. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how many it was. Probably a couple dozen or more. I forget how many they killed exactly. Maybe over a hundred actually. But um, yeah, so yeah, ripped all their hearts out. But anyway, um, so um. Yeah, you've got Pizarro. A little bit of background about uh, who he was. Pizarro was from this town called, I think I'll give you right here, Trujillo, Trujillo, Spain, uh, where a lot of famous conquistadors came from. In fact, he had all these brothers uh, that he had uh, that's well known uh, that kind of went with him uh, to the uh, Gonzalo Pizarro, Juan Pizarro, Hernando Pizarro. Uh, they're all kind of related to each other. They're kind of like the mafia that went down there and controlled like Peru for a while and all that. But Pizarro uh, was um, famous later for conquering Peru in what we call the Inca empire, which the Inca empire was a native American empire that developed in the 15th century. That was mostly in the Andes mountains. Uh, they call actually Andes they're called. And, um, Pizarro himself originally came with Balboa. I don't know if you know this or not, but he and Balboa originally discovered the Pacific Ocean together. And over time, uh, Pizarro became like this uh, kind of like a governor and mayor in, in what is Panama, like above Colombia. And when he was there, he heard about the Inca Empire, uh, which was located uh, to the south. Uh, and uh, the Incas uh, were probably one of the most powerful uh, Native American cultures uh, in the Americas uh, that they had. Uh, they were like high up in the mountains of the Andes. Uh, and uh, they were famous for building these um, staircases on their mountains where they would grow crops like uh, potatoes and maize, I think, 
mostly. And uh, they're called Inca because the, the, the actual rulers or kings of the, of the Incas were called an Inca, uh, which the Inca was kind of like a kind of like a pharaoh. He was kind of worshipped like a god, uh, basically. And then the uh, Incas themselves were called the Quechua people because uh, they spoke like a language called Quechua, against the name. Um, now, Pizarro, what happened was in 1532, he invaded Peru uh, with, an, with a small army of men. Uh, and um, what happened was at what is uh, Cajamarca, which is in northern Peru, they call it the Battle of Cajamarca, I think, as well. He, he went there to meet the Inca ruler uh, of the Inca Empire, whose name was Atahualpa. You may have heard of the name. I think I, I think I might have a picture of Atahualpa uh, to show you. Let me see. Yeah, there he is, Atahualpa. It's one of the last few uh, Inca rulers they had. I think they had two more after that. Uh, that they have. And apparently, uh, Adalpa thought they were just going to have a friendly meeting you know, between the Spanish uh, and the Incas, but it was a surprise attack. And um, Hernando de Soto was involved in it, if you know about this. He was the one that kind of led the attack. Uh, and they captured um, Adalpa. I think they killed like 200, 2,000 of his men, uh, basically, in the attack. And what they did that's very, very famous, they ransomed him. They said, basically, if you, if you don't pay a bunch of gold and silver to us, we're going to kill you. Uh, and uh, there's a famous story where what happened was uh, uh, Ad Alpa took, like, I think, two rooms. They drew a line on the wall. He said, I'm going to fill both those rooms with gold and silver. And they did, which is amazing. Um, and... That's the amount of gold that they may have taken. Like something like 24 tons of gold and silver, I think, was, was actually given to the Spanish. Uh, and the natives couldn't understand is like why they want all this gold. Like what what for? You know, because they, they mostly use it for ritual purposes or whatever. It wasn't really worth money to them, uh, like in, say, in Europe and all that. But that's possibly, yeah, where the El Dorado myth may have come from, too, because they think maybe uh, that the Incas may have hidden some of the some of the gold and silver possibly. And so that's where the thing actually came from. But of course, within a year uh, after they'd gotten all the, all this, you know, wealth or whatever, they, they killed at all. They had him killed. They strangled him basically is what happened. And in 1533, what happened was uh, Pizarro decided to put in one of his brothers, uh, whose name was Manco or something called Banco Inca. Uh, they dubbed him and Manco Inca, um, became like this puppet ruler uh, under Pizarro that kind of ruled instead for like the next three years uh, from 1533 uh, to 1536. I think I've got a picture here. And apparently they treated Manco Inca real bad. Like they actually, uh, I think, raped his wife uh, and um, they just treated him real bad uh, overall. They wouldn't, wouldn't give him any respect anyway because they thought of him as a puppet, basically. And so what happened was in the spring of 1536, he led a rebellion. I think actually, I don't know, February or May. I'm not sure the actual month. It's kind of a debate about when it was. I've got May, maybe the date of when it was. But in the spring of 1536, he uh, got together like something like 100,000 Inca warriors uh, where Cusco is. They laid siege to it. Cusco was the capital of the Inca Empire up in the Andes Mountains. And the siege lasted for like 10 months. It almost looked like they were going to win. Uh, but apparently, you know, what happened was uh, Pizarro was able to get reinforcements uh, in, I don't know, about 100,000, uh, 200,000, maybe been too many. It's 100 to 200,000. They're not sure the exact number. That's probably an exaggeration, 200,000. But um, they think that disease, like smallpox, evidently took a toll on Manco's forces. And Manco was forced to retreat uh, from, from Cusco into like northern Peru. And what happened was Manco then would set up this uh, Neo Inca Empire state in the jungles of Peru, like close to where the Amazon River Basin is. He actually built a city, like a capital, in the middle of the actual jungles of Peru. It's amazing, uh, which was later called the, um, they call it Vilcabamba, is what they dubbed it. I've got a picture of Vilcabamba. Vilcabamba was known as the lost city of the Incas. Uh, and um, I had some pictures of that for you. 
here's some ruins of it up in the Andes Mountains. And uh, he was on the run for like something like nine years uh, from the Spanish. Uh, and eventually the Spanish found him. Eventually they murdered him. They killed him. Uh, Manco Inca. Uh, so uh, kind of a sad story uh, about him. Uh, also, you may have heard of this other site. I want to go ahead and mention it because I usually don't mention it, but I'll go ahead and mention it now. But you may have heard of uh, Machu Picchu uh, as well. Uh, some confuse Machu. Some people confuse Machu Picchu with Vilcabamba. They're not the same thing, uh, believe it or not. It's not really a city, by the way. It was an Inca state and fortress, which was built by a previous Inca ruler uh, in the middle of the 15th century. Uh, and, of course, it was later found in 1911 by the famous American explorer Hiram Bingham, who probably was searching for, like, El Dorado, likely. Uh, and uh, the Spanish, for some reason, never found Machu Picchu. It was just kind of a mystery. It was, I guess, so isolated up in the mountains uh, and all that. And so nobody, nobody knew about it, but it's a big tourist attraction, you know, in Peru, like to go see that. Uh, they had one more Inca ruler, by the way, that reigned later that was famous. I'll mention about the last Inca ruler was Tupac Amaru. You may have heard that name uh, before. He was actually killed by the Spanish in 1572. Now, you hear, you've probably heard of the rapper Tupac. You heard of him? He died young, you know. Uh, I think he was killed. Yeah, that's where he got the name. Tupac got the name from this Inca ruler. Yeah, it's kind of where he borrowed it from. That's where he got the name. And um, so, yeah, after Tupac Amaru died, you know, what happened after that was that Pizarro then was able to take over pretty much the whole Inca empire. Uh, he went on to found what is the city of Lima, which is on the Pacific Ocean, which became like the first European city founded in really uh, South America, which became is now the capital of Peru today, you know, not Cusco anymore. And uh, from there, the Spanish are going to create their own colony, uh, which is Peru, uh, which is like a vice royalty and royal colony uh, that they'll have later. And over time, they're going to expand. The Spanish are going to expand, you know, uh, Peru uh, and make it into like, I think, I think it's eventually three, three vice royalties or colonies uh, that they have later. So I'll probably get to that later. Uh, that's a good stopping point for the week. But uh, I think on uh, next week, next week's lecture on uh, Tuesday, uh, I'm going to uh, finish up the period. Like of, I'm talking about the uh, colonization a little bit of the, the Spanish, like coming to the Americas. I'll get into that. Then I'm going to move on to talk about the uh, age of absolutism. So that's the two main things I'll kind of get into uh, next week. So don't forget before uh, I go today with this lecture, don't forget I did post, of course, uh, the uh, age of discovery quiz uh, that I've got up now. So y'all need to kind of, you know, start working on that. That's of course due, like I said, next Thursday, I believe it's the February the 4th is when that one's due. Uh, and um, so that's something y'all should be concentrating on. Cause I think the reformation one's pretty much closed uh, for now. Uh, if you missed that, well, you might have to make it up later. I'll, I'll have a makeup period later uh, if you missed it for some reason. Uh, so we'll, we'll do that later uh, more or less. But uh, try to get that done, uh, the Canvas quiz on the age of discovery. So I guess I don't have any other questions uh, today, it looks like it. But like I said, uh, if you have any other questions, of course, about this lecture, uh, comments, let me know later uh, through my YouTube channel. You can send me you know, any kind of comments you want. Um, you, know, you get bonus points for that. And that's it for today. I uh, hope you all have a good weekend coming up. Uh, and all. Yeah, it's 50 years old today. Can't believe it. You know, God. I guess another 50, that could be 100. <laughs> so y'all take care. Have a great weekend. Okay.